Thank you so very much uh, for uh, Professor Mertel for coming in here to uh, let us interview you. <laughs> well, Adam, it's my great pleasure. Thank you. Okay, the first question is, uh, how do you feel when you uh, won the Nobel Prize? Prize? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I was amazingly surprised. Um, one might almost say shocked, but it, it was, uh, there's nothing quite like it. It was so, such a surprise that I almost couldn't believe it. And then I believed it and then I just said, wow. And I thought, this is uh, such an incredible experience. If, if you're a scientist, to not only be recognized by your peers for your work, but there are many people, who, many scientists who have done very good work, work good enough to receive Nobel Prize, but they only give one every year, which means many of the people who were good enough won't get it. And so even if you thought maybe your work was good enough, it doesn't mean necessarily you get it. So it was a great surprise, a wonderful surprise, and uh, there's just really no experience like that, I think, for, for scientists. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the second question is, how do you get it? How did you get it? Well, that's a <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, you don't start out your life and you don't go into science or into research with the idea I'm going to do this because I want to win a Nobel Prize because it's, it's, the likelihood is very, very small. Um, but you become excited about the field, about whatever you're studying. You get intrigued by it. something that you really enjoy doing and thinking about. And it's a challenge, a challenge for your mind. And then you uh, get involved in working in this research and you find it exciting. There's a lot of times it's very frustrating. It's like, you know, you practice, 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 and things don't work. The same thing, you try this path, you try that path, nothing seems to work. But when it does work, the rewards of feeling you get of having found the path, found a solution to this challenging problem. So that's what drives you to most of your, your life. And then if you're fortunate enough to solve the right kind of problem, one that's viewed as having a large impact on your field, and then you, and, and a lot of that's also good luck. You can work hard, you can be, you can train very hard and do everything, but you also need a little bit of good luck. If you have all of that and you then have a chance to even be considered, which is a great honor, and it happens, then it happens. But you don't start out in your field saying, I want to go and get a Nobel Prize. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. No, it's not that kind of goal. So if you're asking me what kind of characteristics I think it takes, I think it takes, of course, a certain amount of talent and skill and training but it, it takes, I think, a, 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 an excitement, a, a passion about what you're working on, so that you you're very immersed in it. You know what I mean? You're very your mind is it's kind of the first thing you think about when you get up in the morning, and it's the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night. And you do that not because anyone's told you to. You've done that because it's from inside what you want to learn, and then it takes a lot of hard work, but it doesn't always feel like hard work because you're enjoying it. Sort of like playing the piano if you enjoy it. And then, um, with that luck again, if something comes through, then that's the way to get there. But it's hard work. You have to have talent and skill. You have to be willing to fail. Fail sometimes many times. But you have to have a feeling, a passion, that you think you can get to the right answer. 
that there is an answer. And how you know that, I can't tell you. I don't know how you know, but you know. And sometimes you, there are some problems when you get there, they're not, they're not ready to be solved. They need to be put away for a while. But when you find the right one and you stay on it, then you just keep at it and keep at it. And if you fail, you fail, you fail. Uh, Thomas Edison, inventor, he invented the light bulb. He was a very practical man. He was a scientist too, but more really an engineer. When he described all the different ways that he failed in getting to it, he didn't describe it as failures. He said, I learned something. I learned this wasn't the way to do it. So you put a positive way of thinking about it. You have to have that view. You can't expect, in reality, that the first time, the first idea you have for solving it works. You might, but you have to be prepared to over and over again and have that confidence and the willingness to work very hard. And those together are the things we seem to see that I think will help you get there. Oh, and you have to live a long life because you can't get a Nobel Prize unless you're alive. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a long time. Okay? Yeah. Uh, how long time did it uh, take uh, to get a Nobel Prize? Well, um, the work I did for which the prize was given uh, was done more between about the ages of 24, 23, 24, and I don't know, maybe 27, 23, 24 to 27. Um, the prize itself I received 24 years later, I was 50, uh, 53, so you have to wait sometimes a, a long time. Those, those, that sounds like a very long time, doesn't it? Waiting 25 years, but when you're older, maybe it won't look quite so long. do you spend more time on? Uh, learning, teaching, or using your knowledge? Which one do you, would you like, uh, like to do? I like, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, good question, because you have to do mixtures of all of these things. So sometimes you're learning, learning by reading other people's work and seeing what they've done to help see if that helps you to understand how to do something new that no one has ever done before that's interesting and may have value. Uh, sometimes you're learning by playing with the subject. You know, you think of scientists as very serious and working on blackboards or on their computers and they're very serious. And in a way they are, but in another way, you need to learn to play with the subject. You, you experiment, you try things, you see, it, and it's almost like playing with the subject. If you, do you know what I mean? Just yeah. as, and you need to do this and explore, and this is a form of learning from within. You learn by doing it, not by what you read or what someone teaches in the classroom, but you, do, you learn by, well, I call it playing with the subject and you try things and explore. Um, that's, a lot of that's fun, because it's new, you're doing it yourself. It's like if you were playing with trying to come up with a new musical composition. You try different things out and explore, and that's a key part of it. And then, if you get a good idea, okay, you get a good, you think it's, but it's a very little, when the idea just starts, it's like a little plant. It's very, very vulnerable. If you're tough on the idea at the beginning, they'll crush it, it'll go away. So you have to be very gentle with the idea, okay, when it's, when it's young. You give it every benefit, and then it grows and it grows as you develop the idea. But then at some point when it's grown enough, then you're very tough on it, and you, subjected to every kind of question and quiz to see if it really will hold up. 
to challenge. Because that's what happens in science always. The process is one of creation or potential creation and then challenging that creation. People, yourself and others, will say, well, does it do this or have you tried that? Or maybe what you think you have doesn't work. So it's always a challenge. You understand what I mean by a challenge? So it's like this little plant gets big enough, strong enough, then you subject it to very extreme tests. And if it holds up to the test, then you know you've created something. So gentle to begin with, give it a chance to grow, and then very, very tough at the end to see if it can sustain itself. And that's part of the, the, the process. And then, after all of that, only after all of that, then you write it up on your computer or however you do it. You write <coughs> in a very organized way. Here was the challenge, here was the problem, here's what we did, here's how it worked, here's how it is, here's our findings, and this is our conclusion. It looks very, very orderly, step one, step two, step three. But the reality of how it was discovered is not orderly. You might have gone step three, then step one, then step seven. You do it all kinds of strange ways. It's only at the very end that it's then organized into a very rigorous and logical pattern. It doesn't get discovered that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, and that's the final, then you put the, your work out there to the world, you give it to the world for free. We don't charge for it. You give it to the world, and then the world looks at it, and they say, is this interesting? Mm -hmm. You hope. Is it correct? Because then they really test it. And if it holds up after all of that, then you've created something, you've added to the body of knowledge. And that's your personal reward and your professional reward. You've added to the body of knowledge something that didn't, as far as we know, exist or be understood before. So you've created something. And you also get paid for doing that if you're a professor, so that's how you get to live. Do you travel a lot, and uh, who do you um, do you travel a lot? Uh, I do now. I travel all over the world. Um, sometimes I well to do two things. Often to speak about scientific work, academic work, with other scientists and other teachers and academics around the world. But sometimes I also use what I created or discovered for practical solutions on things that influence people's lives. So when we do that, then you talk to people who will use these ideas to make things to help people be better. You talk to governments to the extent that this helps them to do what they're supposed to do better. You talk to businesses. Um, you talk to labor unions sometimes, people who are in charge of workers. Uh, but you convey your knowledge transformed into how this can be used to actually build things or create things that will make people better. So if you are a medical scientist and you find uh, a, do a new way of doing a surgery that works better, then in addition to the science underneath that, you teach the technique so that others can perform the surgery the same way. Uh, if you've discovered a, uh, a new type of material, then that allows people to build things that they couldn't build before. Uh, you have to help them to understand how this thing you've created, just as a matter of knowledge creation, can be converted into knowledge that can be used to help people live better lives. And uh, so in my travels, I do both of those. I have both those things. And so I travel a lot, and it's all around the world. I meet some very interesting people. And that's pretty exciting, because if you can see something that you've done gets taken and in some way helps to make things better for people, that's a 
a wonderful feeling that they take something you created and make make people better. And that's another kind of reward. So the early stuff, you get a reward from creating the knowledge, but from the implementation of it, you get a sense of accomplishment or reward because what you've done will matter to people's lives. It will make them better. Okay? Thank you so much. Well, it was my pleasure, Adam, and thank you for your very, very thoughtful questions. Thank you. Okay.